Hey guys, welcome to a Dave Swartz Art Comic Book Coloring Video. Uh, in today's video, we're going to be coloring a page from Feast or Famine, uh, my story published by Alterna Comics. Uh, this page is from the very first issue. Uh, this is a scene where Edison is displaying his superior light technology right across from our hero, Tuska, at this World Fair. Uh, so... First thing I want to do is I want to start out with some flat color. Uh, so what I do first is I go through each panel and separate each panel uh, with its own unique color. And then I go through and start to color in all of my subjects. Um, usually working from largest to smallest. So just the same as I would do it in drawing where I want to kind of start with the largest shape and work to the smallest shape. I want to do the same exact thing here with coloring. Um, so I'm just kind of going through and laying in flats, but along the way, what I'm also trying to do is create uh, some lighting. Um, so I have some kind of direction as to where to go next with everything. So uh, in this first panel, I'm just kind of trying to create almost like a centralized light um, that's backlighting Edison and his two uh, large goons there. So laying in some purple. Um, I always try to kind of play around with different color palettes depending on the type of mood that's going on. Um, in this scene in particular, uh, this is set during the turn of the century, so you can see in this kind of full colored page that I keep referencing back to, uh, has a bit of a desaturated palette. I'm trying to use more cool tones uh, so that the rest of the book kind of has a distinct uh, style when we come back to the present. Um, but all the while, I'm still kind of hinting at some little warm tones here and there just to help, you know, place some separation between each panel. Uh, when we go from one panel to the next, it's kind of important to, you know, try to create something that's unique about each panel um, just so that they separate. Um, if you were to use the same exact color palette for each panel, it's going to get really flat um, and not very interesting. It's not going to push and pull you through the story. Um, it's one of the things that I teach uh, my, my graphic, uh, graphic novel students is how to, you know, create a compelling story. And a lot of times what it is is just sort of pulling and pushing um, with, with the reader's attention. So if you have something that's super flat, they're not really going to be involved in it very much. It's almost going to feel like it's um, detached from them. So you want to make sure that your coloring has a bit of a, a unique uh, style to it so that from panel to panel it feels like things are changing and things are you know kind of evolving So next I'm going through and I'm putting in some of uh, my my highlights my light sources um, You know I sort of started with my backgrounds, but then now um, Since the lights in this panel in particular are kind of really important uh, I wanted to start off by really kind of just placing those in um, And here I mean I can just kind of blow my brush up real big and just hit it once boom and I'm done um, I might have to go back in there and maybe clean it up a little bit, but for the most part, I want to kind of use that brush to my advantage. So what I'm doing now is using the pen tool uh, to create a nice tight selection around Edison. Um, and I use the pen tool a lot when I'm blocking out uh, more complex shapes, especially shapes that have a lot of organic quality to them. Uh, I want to be able to create natural curves and, and natural angles uh, that work well for the subject that I'm trying to, to trace. Um, if I were to maybe just be tracing out a box or something that's much more linear that doesn't have a whole lot of organic quality to it, um, then I'd probably choose to use like the you know linear lasso tool or something like that that's a little bit more um, quick and effective. So after you get your path uh, you know, drawn out for the, the area that you want to select, you right click or on a Mac you hit command and then click and it'll give you um, some options. You want to hit make selection and that will give you a nice solid selection around just about anything that you can trace with that pen tool. And I know the pen tool can, tool, I'm sorry, can be a little tricky at first if you're not used to it. Um, but honestly, I really encourage everybody out there to practice with it and, and really just don't get intimidated by it. Uh, when I first started using it, I, I was like, what the heck is wrong with this tool? It's ridiculous. I can't make it get it to work. I can't make it do anything that I want it to do. And a lot of that is just practice, you know, and learning how the tool works, uh, where best to place your points. Um, and, and actually, it gives me a, a thought, you know, really quick. 
this little thing that I'm, uh, this little device that I'm uh, tracing out right now, it's got a lot of, you know, circular kind of angles to it. And where I'm choosing to place my points is I want to put the point right where the angle changes. So if something is sort of on a natural curve, as soon as that curve starts to change in a different direction, that's where you put your pen or your, uh, uh, your point for your pen tool. Okay. So a lot of times with the pen tool, it's about trying to do it as, as efficiently as possible without having to put down a, a ton of points. Um, so the best thing in my mind is to, to find that point in which your subject matter changes angles and that's where you put uh, your next point for your pen tool. So again, I'm just going around and making sure that I've got all of my different uh, subjects sort of separated out and each time I create a new color, I create a new layer. So you can kind of, you know, maybe watch the layer palette grow ever so slightly as I, you know, add more and more color uh, and separation uh, to each panel. Um, and sometimes what I'll do is I'll try to create one solid mask or one solid flat color uh, for every individual person or subject or, or what have you in order to create um, a quick mask. So that's kind of what I'm doing here is I'm creating quick masks uh, for all of my individual parts so that I could easily come back, uh, hit the command key and click on the little thumbnail and the layer palette and that's going to give you an instant selection around that that one object. Um, so you know, in the case of like these people, you know, where I, I need to be able to paint lots of different flesh tones, lots of different shirt colors and dress colors and hat colors and all that stuff. Uh, yeah, I can quickly reference back to that mask that I originally created and be able to color those in quickly without having to do a lot of erasing. So. Again, just filling in some of these flats. I'm trying to keep my color palette pretty cool. Um, but all the, all the while, I'm trying to also find opportunities where I can create light and where I can hit things really almost very simply uh, so I don't have to do a lot of rendering, a lot of painting. So right now, I'm just blocking out these stages and just kind of hitting it with a little bit of, of light so I can get... A separation between the top side of the, the stage and that's almost like underside the side that's not really going to catch a whole lot of light. Okay so again here what I'm doing is I'm using my brushes to my advantage so I have a whole set of uh, brush like strokes almost like uh, acrylic paint strokes that, that I did uh, a long time ago. Uh, where I use these a lot is backgrounds uh, or light, uh, especially for like dirt or anything that's supposed to be kind of grimy or dirty. Uh, these things work perfect. Gives you some little bit of texture without going too crazy. Um, I've also used them for clouds before. Those are really great for clouds. Woo! Zoomed in there real quick. Uh, but then I use these splatter uh, brushes for a lot of like dirt and you know kind of grime. Um, they can also be used for uh, blood splatter or water. You know, I used them for waterfalls a lot before. Um, so again, use your brushes to your advantage. You know, you don't have to kill yourself going in there and painting all these little dots or all these little, you know, hatches or anything like that. Um, you know, you can create your own brushes. Uh, you know, one of the things you can do really simply in Photoshop is just go up to edit and define brush preset. And that'll pretty much make anything that you want into a brush. So I've chosen some kind of, you know, medium tone kind of purple for uh, my mask here because I figured that, you know, uh, most of these outfits are going to kind of have this darker purple tone to it. Um, when I'm, you know, choosing the color for these initial kind of flats, I'm just trying to choose the color that I, I think is going to be used the most. Um, again, starting from macro and going down to micro level. So this time, you know, I'm, I'm just sort of painting things in with a, a regular, um, just a regular brush. There's, there's nothing fancy. This is like the old basic, you know, uh, brush in Photoshop. It's very hard edge. There's no, you know, fade to it or anything like that. Because really what I, what I want here is I want a nice clean edge. Um, so I'm kind of just using that in conjunction with the eraser to be able to paint in all these little tiny people. 
Now you could be, you know, asking me, oh, Dave, why aren't you using the pen tool? Well, you know, in these types of situations where it's just sort of a small area, you know, I find that the pen tool can almost be a little too much. Um, you can get almost get a little bit too into the, the little tiny areas that just change ever so slightly. And it almost becomes a little bit too confusing. Um, so in my mind, something like this just, it might be a little bit more uh, tedious to have to switch back and forth between the paintbrush and the eraser. Um, but honestly, I think in the, in the long run, this is gonna be a little bit faster than using the pen tool. Um, you know, and then that's one thing that as a colorist, as a, an artist, you know, writer, uh, creator, really, um, you know, you need to be able to figure out where in your process you can reduce the amount of time you're putting in, right? I mean, you don't want to have to kill yourself doing everything um, the hard way, right? We want to make sure that we can objectively look at our process sometimes and say, okay, maybe I can improve that. Maybe this is a better process. Maybe I should try this out to see if it, it makes me faster. Um, and I, I think nine times out of 10, it does. Uh, for me personally, I can say when I first started coloring comics, I, uh, it took me maybe like eight to 10 hours to color one page. It was crazy. Um, and now I can color a page in like two hours, you know, and it's just because my process has gotten refined down through the years to a point where I don't really think about it anymore. I just react. Um, and the same thing with color choice. Um, you know, a, a lot of times uh, students will ask me, you know, how do I choose the right color? Like, what is the right color for this scene? And a lot of times you just have to ask yourself critical questions, you know, um, in this scene in particular, you know, we're outdoors. Um, so a lot of the lighting is going to be dictated by, you know, what's going on outside and it's nighttime. So there's not going to be any sunlight. So the only light source that we have right now are, are the lights, are, are the, the light bulbs, the, the ambient light in the area. Um, so it's not going to be very bright. It's going to be a little bit dull. Um, but you know, we want to make sure that whatever highlights we paint next are going to be very harsh. You know, um, when you have lighting that's, that's really bright like this with, a, uh, in a dark environment, um, the, the, the light is going to be really intense. You're going to have a high contrast. Whereas if you are outside in say, you know, regular daylight, um, you know, almost maybe even overcast. So it's not quite direct sunlight. Um, that's going to be really almost, uh, 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 not as contrasted, you know, it's going to have almost like a nice blended, um, sort of quality to it. You're not going to see a high highlight, um, on any of your paintings. So, um, that's where you start. You start where the environment tells you, um, you know, what, what the lighting in the environment is going to tell you about the scene. Um, and then in my mind, you just rely on your color theory. So, <clears throat> if I know that I, I have a lot of areas here that are going to be purple, or, or I'm sorry, if you have areas in here that you're going to be warm lit, right? Lots of warm white, uh, I'm sorry, even like yellow light, you know, then that's why I would go with maybe more like a purpley tone for some of the other things like my subject matter. Um, so again, using your color theory, using what you know about the environment to direct you to the most appropriate choice. Uh, for your colors. So what I've been doing is just laying in more of the light, um, trying to uh, figure out uh, how I'm going to separate each one of these uh, different people from one another. Um, and then also trying to figure out, <clears throat> you know, what, what's my next move, you know, what's the next biggest area. Um, and then I also think about um, trying to layer each individual thing as if it was, you know, layered like pieces of paper almost. So like you've got the background as your, 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 your layer one. And then you've got maybe a little bit of light on that background is layer two above that. And then the thing that comes right in front of that is the next layer, right? So all of these people aren't going to come till much later in your layers, right? And even the guys that are really, really close to the camera, those guys are going to be all the way at the top, right? So I always try to keep all of my layers in a, in a, a reasonably understand or understandable way so that you can get to things quickly. You can understand how things are going to, you know, overlap. Um, and you don't necessarily have to worry so much about erasing when you do that. You can almost just say to yourself, okay, I know I'm going to paint over that area anyway in a new layer. So I don't necessarily have to worry about erasing. 
Um, a lot of times that's where um, new artists with uh, this digital stuff get tripped up is they feel like everything has to be perfect, everything has to be tight. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be. You can just kind of overlay that with a new layer um, and you knew you're going to have to do it anyway. So just, you know, work smarter, not harder, right? So again, using the pen tool, going around here, getting happy little S and his own little mask. And again, I try to start with the, the most important subject and then kind of work my way, you know, outward. So um, the, the reason I do this, I want to give more attention to my focal point um, so that I don't get that lost in everything else right so if we spend too much time on the background elements or you know maybe i spent too much time on this little you know thug guy here um you know the focal point could get distracting and you know it's it's could be a problem for you know not only the storytelling but the enjoyment of the reader um so i try my best to to stay focused on the the, the main focus of each panel uh with without losing you know, track of you know the whole big picture, right? Um, so oftentimes what you'll notice with my comic book coloring is I'll start with one area and then I'll jump to another area and then come back to the area I was before and then maybe go to another area unexpectedly. Um, and I'm just doing that to, to keep it fresh, you know, um, to, to make sure that I'm not losing you know the big picture. Um, painting this again, I'm not exactly sure why the heck I had to paint these again probably because the first layer got lost or either I just didn't like what I was doing. Um, so we're going to go in, we're going to use our, our just basic, simple brush tool again to uh, fill in some of these lights. And we're almost done with the flats. We've got probably uh, some flesh tones we got to figure out. we got to figure out the shirt tones. Oh yeah, so now we're doing some uh, color holds. So we got... Um, the ability to paint in the line work itself. So um, this is a little bit of a, a trick, um, but it's it's not uh, not complicated at all. So the idea here is uh, we've got a black line, but we want to be able to paint that black line in with some other type of color. Um, I do this a lot for areas that need um, intense light um, or areas that are going to be translucent, um, say like water, um, any kind of liquid uh, or like a mirror surface or glass windows. I do that a lot for window uh, glare a lot. Um, but the, the trick of it is, is uh, creating a layer above your line work. Uh, and then the line work should be set to multiply. Uh, that was something I probably should have mentioned way back at the beginning. But uh, anyway, so you're going to want to create a new layer above that line work. And then you're going to create a layer clipping mask from that layer to your line work. So what you're going to do is hover your cursor between the two layers that you want to clip together. And then you're going to hold down the Alt key or the Option key on a Mac. Um, I can't really remember what the heck it is on a PC, but on a Mac it's the Alt key. And you're going to click between those two layers. So when you hold down the Alt key and you hover between those two layers, you're going to see a little arrow that kind of drops down in your cursor. And that tells you that you can create a clipping mask. So you click that, and what it's going to do is it's going to take that layer that's above and it's going to clip it to the layer that's below. And what that means is that anything that you put on that layer above is only going to show up on, the, on what you see of the layer below. So say um, for this uh, word Edison, right? So if I were to have that on one layer by itself and I had a, another layer above it clipped to it, I could paint anything within that word Edison, but it wouldn't go outside of the word Edison. It would just stay within what I painted on that previous layer, okay? So this is perfect for if we want to be able to paint color into our line work, okay? So we would create a new layer above our line work, create the clipping mask, and then we'd be able to paint on the line work itself. Now, if you were to just do that, you'd probably be like, what the heck, it's not working. I, I, I don't understand why it's not working. Well, it can give you a little bit of a, of a weird kind of effect. And one of the things that I like to do in order to make it look a little bit better is I change the blend mode from that top layer to lighten. Okay, so when you change it to lighten, 
it'll give you a really nice, rich, solid colored line. Okay, so a combination of a clip mask as well as changing the blend mode to lighten is going to give you the ability to color in the line work itself. Um, now, this would this is a method that's used for just line work that's uh, done outside of Photoshop. If you're to just get like a, a flattened black and white JPEG um, from the artist. Uh, but if the artist himself or herself is actually drawing the the page in Photoshop and the lines are all by themselves, then you don't necessarily have to worry about the lighten stage. You can just clip it right to it. Okay, the clipping mask should work um, if the lines are created originally in Photoshop. Okay. All right, so now we're getting into some crowd fun. So we've got our crowd clip mask. You can see that I've engaged the mask around what I painted for the crowd. So you can see where areas I didn't paint all the way, but I don't necessarily need to paint it all the way if it's filled with black. So I'm starting to go around and filling in the flesh tones, getting all that separated. And again, I, every time that I change a, a color, I want to make a new layer. So all these flesh tones uh, are going to be on their own layer. And then when I go to, you know, say uh, I want to start painting in a hair color, right? Then that's going to be on its own separate layer. Okay. And even if you go from one different type of hair color to another type of hair color, those two different hair colors are on their own layer. All right. And the reason why I want those to be on their own separate layers is because if I want to be able to change those hair colors really quickly, I can do that without having to do any repainting, right? Or any kind of masking or anything like that. Um, oftentimes what will happen when you're working for a client professionally is you're gonna do something that you think is amazing. You think, oh, this is the perfect set of colors. I nailed it, you know, I couldn't get any better, right? So you send it into the, the, the client, they send it back and they say, oh, you know, actually we kind of wanted their, you know, outfits to be blue instead of purple, right? Or we wanted their, you know, uh, hair color to be red instead of brown, right? Uh, well, it's going to be a little bit harder to have to go back in and change those things if all of those different parts are on the same layer. If they're on different layers though, what you can do is you can either go in and you can change what the color is using an adjustment layer. So you would click on the, there's a little, a little box at the very bottom of your layers palette that almost looks like a yin yang sign. It's like half black, half white. So if you click on that, That'll give you a set of adjustment layers, and one of those adjustment layers is uh, hue and saturation. So you could click on that, and you could change the hue or even the saturation of that color to whatever you would need it to be. Um, now, one little thing I should mention about that is if you're using adjustment layers, it's a good idea to also use them with that clipping mask um, idea that I talked about before. So if you create an adjustment layer, it's a really good idea to also clip that adjustment layer to the layer you want to adjust. If you don't do that, what you're going to find is that that adjustment layer without a clip is going to, to adjust every other layer that's below it. Okay, Adjustment layers work by adjusting everything that's below it, or if it's clipped to something, it'll only adjust what it's clipped to. Okay, So the next thing I'm doing is going back through and trying to make sure that I've nailed every individual color. So I'm almost there. I've got uh, maybe some different hair colors, uh, a couple flesh tones that I got to uh, <laughs> flesh out here, pardon the pun. Um, but I'm almost there. I'm really close to the painting stage. Now this in particular paint process is a little bit different than what I'm doing now. I think I painted this page, geez, about a year ago, uh, maybe even further back than that. I can't really remember off the top of my head, uh, but I did paint this quite a while ago, and my process has changed a bit. Um, I, I used to paint in a much more traditional way, so uh, what you're going to see here is a bit more of a traditional approach 
um, a little bit more difficult, I think, and a little bit more tedious, okay? Um, so I've got all my flats laid down. It looks like I'm about ready to start painting um, some, some real light in here. Um, but I mean, at, at this point, you can really see that a lot has been done. A lot has been accomplished. Um, so we're, we're just about getting into the lighting now. So what I'm doing is I'm going in and I'm just kind of trying to find the areas that are going to catch the light. And oftentimes I'm going to paint something maybe two to three times before I really think I'm comfortable with what I've uh, accomplished. Um, sometimes what happens is you, you get through it and you're like, ah, oh, you know what? I don't think the lighting's quite right on that. You know, maybe it's going to hit this side of the face a little differently, or maybe that side of the face, uh, differently. So I might have to try it a couple different times before I get it. Um, uh, but you know, most of the time, uh, it's, it's not too difficult to figure out if I did the first stage right. All right, so you can see it as I'm painting, I'm using, I'm, I've selected just the flesh tone of Edison here. And I did that because I, I, I don't want to have to erase anything that goes beyond the flesh area, right? So if I didn't have a, a, a selection uh, to stay within, I'd have to do a lot of erasing. And that erasing causes so much extra time that you don't need to, to put yourself through. So this is the reason why I think it's it's not you know not only important to, to keep things separate to be able to edit them, but it's also important to keep things separate so that you can create all these individual uh, masks for yourself as you're going through the painting process. So this is the, just the first layer. So uh, most of my painting is gonna be done with just this first layer. Then I'll maybe go through and do a second layer of highlight, uh, maybe some rim light, uh, you know, areas where the light is going to just catch uh, the edge of individual shapes or objects, um, you know, just to make it look as though everything exists within the environment. Um, if you don't do this the last stage where, you know, you kind of add in some, some highlights and try to add some of the light to it, um, you know, it's not going to come out quite as natural. So what I'm doing here, what I was mentioning before is, you know, this is sort of the traditional uh, approach of painting where I'm going through and I'm selecting the color uh, that, I, that I did my flat with, and then I'm just increasing the value. So I'm taking my, my cur cursor in the color picker and I'm just moving it closer to the white corner. And I'm also increasing maybe just a little bit of the hue from, you know, it's, it's native purple into maybe a little bit more of a red. Um, because I'm, I'm asking myself the question, you know, what is the color of the light source and the color of the light source in this scene is going to most likely going to be around a yellowy type hue. Um, you know, you might get a little bit of a, a blue from that turbine from uh, Tesca's stage, uh, but it's, it's not going to be nearly as bright as some of these other um, yellow, uh, you know, fair lights that are all over these stages. So, you know, I, I, I keep that in mind and I say, okay, if it's yellow, then I want to move my color, my, my highlighted color closer to that yellow spectrum. Now it doesn't necessarily have to be yellow. It could be just kind of closer to it. So if you've got like a purpley tone, then maybe you want to, move it a little closer to the red hue because red has a little more yellow in it than purple does. Same thing with uh, the flesh tone, right? So the flesh tone, the base tone was almost kind of like a purpley, um, but then I moved it to a little bit more of that orangey, you know, kind of uh, hue because I wanted it to be a bit warmer. All right, so I, I've got my goons in there. I've got my Edison in there. I'm starting to paint some of the, the light in the backgrounds. And again, using my masks to my advantage, you know, I don't want to do a lot of extra erasing if I don't have to. Um, so masks are your friend. Don't think that it's an extra step that you don't have to do and you can just, you know, do it by hand and hope to God you don't have things that go over the edge. Um, I just err on the side of caution and mask it out. All right, so what I'm doing now is I'm kind of looking back to the previous page and making sure that I, you know, all of my hues are, are looking correct. Um, sometimes what happens when you're doing a, a, an ongoing series or a series that has just a tremendous amount of pages to it, uh, you wanna make sure there's a consistency 
uh, along the way. So that's why I usually, when I color, I have the previous page open so that I can reference back to it. I can compare the two quickly and see if there's anything about um, what I'm painting, um, you know, that's that's really not working. Um, so again, just going, kind of going in here and painting in the light, uh, making sure that I, I start with that focal point. So in this panel, it's it's Tesca. He's the one speaking. So I'm going to start with him, and then I'm going to move on to my secondary focal point, which would be Edison, who he's speaking to. And then from there, I'll work my way to the background. And oftentimes when I'm painting in subjects versus um, background elements, um, what oftentimes what I'll do is I'll change uh, my brush as well, the, the, the type of brush that I'm using. Um, so with these sort of more important areas, the, the, the main focal uh, points of each panel, I'll try to paint those with, uh, with a, a more, I would say, a smoother brush something that's got uh, just a, a little less of a grit to it. Um, but then some of these background elements, uh, you know, like the, the turbine, the, the, the uh, stage, you know, the curtain, all that sort of stuff, you know, that sort of stuff I might paint in with a, a little rougher edged brush. And that's kind of what I'm using right now. It's, it has almost like a, a crayon quality to it or uh, like, a, like a, not even like colored pencil. Uh, it, it almost has, oh, you know what? It has almost like a dry pastel, you know, kind of look to it. It has a very rough edge. Um, but, you know, I find that it, it works really well uh, for background elements, things that su are supposed to have a little bit of texture to it. Um, it. It just doesn't look as good for, you know, flesh tones or, um, you know, certain types of clothing um, that are supposed to have more of a, a smooth uh, texture to them. Okay, so uh, as I'm going through here, I'm again trying to make sure that I, you know, am not losing track of what the focal point is, uh, you know, what is the most important part of each panel, um, and then also making sure that I don't forget about certain areas. So, uh, you know, before I move past this panel, panel two, I want to make sure that I can throw in this, this colored line to make that turbine really kind of stand out, make it look as though it actually is kind of glowing a bit. Um, and, and oftentimes I do make mistakes. You know, I forget that I, you know, didn't color this in or I, you know, forgot to, to add that in there. Um, so if I ever find that I forgot something, I want to do it immediately so that I don't forget it again, right? Um, that's probably the worst thing that can happen is you, you know, you see something, you, you, you say, oh, I'm going to worry about that later. Uh, and then you get down to the end of the page, it's three o'clock in the morning and you just want to go to bed and you forgot about that one little detail uh, that's just going to gnaw you, right? So if you ever are going through your page and you see something that, oh, okay, I uh, missed that, but eh, I'm too lazy. I don't want to do that right now. Uh, don't be lazy. Get it done, right? That way it's just done. You don't have to worry about it. It's something that's it's resolved and you can move on to, to greater things. All right, so now I've created my, my mask again for all of my, my crowd there. So what I can do is easily go through and paint, okay? So uh, like I said before, I'm going through and I'm doing the traditional method where I'm just sort of choosing a, the, the flat color that I started with, and then I'm increasing the value ever so slightly, and then maybe changing the hue a little bit to be closer to the light source um, color. But... One of the things that I've been doing differently in my, my most recent work is I've actually been doing a different technique um, that I'm going to show you guys in a new video uh, it's coming soon uh, featuring another comic book series that I'm working on at the moment. Uh, it's a totally different process. It's a process that I actually learned um, from watching uh, the DC artist Francis Manipool. If you haven't checked out Francis Manipool's artwork on Instagram, especially his Thursday breakdowns of his work, I highly suggest it. Um, but anyway, his uh, approach to it is a little bit different. Uh, what he does is he does all of his flats like I, I normally did here. Uh, but instead of going through and individually picking uh, different colors for you know every individual you know area, 
what he does is he creates a layer at the very top of all of his layers. So it's all the way at the top. And he just fills the whole canvas with the color that is closest to your light source. Okay, so in this case, it would be a yellow or almost a pale yellow, like a very, very light yellow. So I would choose that light yellow color. I would fill the entire canvas with it. And then I would change the blend mode. He uses screen. I typically use overlay. Now you can use however you feel comfortable, however you think works best for your style. Um, but if you change the blend mode to you know something in that range, you know overlay, screen, soft light, something like that. Um, even maybe playing with the opacity of that layer to get a good mix. Um, that is going to, to start giving you, you know, almost like a, a lighter, uh, appropriately colored light that when applied or mixed to all of your flats is going to give you a nice uh, highlighted color or lit side um, of, of everything that you paint. So um, what you then do to paint with that is you create a layer mask and then fill that layer mask with black. So essentially what you're doing is you're taking all of that away, right? All of that mixed light away. And then what you're gonna do is use that layer mask as the area in which you paint. So then you would pick a paintbrush, the paintbrush that you wanna use, change your color to white, because we wanna take away the black, we want to reveal the light underneath, and then just paint with that, and you can paint any on top of any color that you want or any kind of um, area that you want so I don't have to go through and pick new color for each individual part of my page um, it works across all color so no matter what colors you're using uh, you can just paint across them in one stroke and don't have to worry about picking new colors for each part um, and it works for both light and for shadow so if you want to apply shadow across something um, multiple colors, you can do that too. Um, so I must treat my flats um, before I get to the stage as like a middle tone. Um, and then I will use these, you know, uh, layers above the screen layer, uh, you know, the shadow layer, um, and, and paint in my light source and my shadow. Um, now for the shadow side, instead of using like screen or um, uh, overlay, uh, I choose uh, multiply. For my shadow um, and typically I try to really drop down the opacity quite a bit for the shadow side because I, I find that it comes out a little bit too dark sometimes so that would be the the, the newer process I'm, I'm gonna do a new video um, talking all about that um, as well as uh, starting to do some live videos um, so that's one thing too that I want to uh, start doing for everybody is uh, weekly live videos uh, just watching me go through the process of painting and uh, drawing a comic book page um, in real time. So the idea is, you know, try to answer some questions uh, along the way, uh, let you guys see, you know, uh, how I work, uh, you know, maybe uh, even, you know, suggest some things along the way. You know, I might be able to ask you guys, like, hey, what color do you want me to color this, you know, and see if uh, anybody can give me something that uh, might be interesting. Okay, um, so those are going to start pretty soon. Uh, I've got uh, a brand new uh, campaign coming up uh, next week, July 13th is this the launch date. Uh, that'll be for the collected edition of Feast or Famine, the comic book that this page is featured in. Uh, but we're going to talk about that much, much more as uh, we get closer and closer to July 13th. So getting back to this color, coloring job here. So i almost done with the light source. Uh, I, I've gone through the other panels and painted those in, and now I'm on to the last panel. So when I'm painting in faces, I try my best to, you know, break it down into the planes of the face. So when, I, when you first saw me start there, I started with the sides um, because the sides are going to be hit with the most light, right? So this character is, is primarily backlit. There's going to be a little bit of light, that shines uh, on the front of his face, but it's, it's only going to be reflected light. Um, so I, I'm really just going to be hitting the sides of the faces here, both for these goons. 
um, and then maybe just a little bit that you see there on the forehead um, and a little bit on the chin and in the upper lip. Uh, but for the most part, I allow my middle tone to act as a, a lot of my shadow um, for, for this technique. And then I'm going to go through and paint in my, my suits. I'm going to paint in the hair. I'm going to get all that established. Um, and then once that's done, I should be on to doing a little bit of rim light, a little bit of extra highlight, and then this baby should be put to bed. Getting pretty close there. But again, using those layer masks to your advantage, I can't stress it enough. Um, you know, one of my main goals with these videos is to, to let you guys in on some of the, the tricks that I've learned along the way, um, things that have made my process go you know, a lot faster. Uh, you know, so I can get back to doing the fun things like actually reading comic books, you know, maybe actually playing some video games or uh, watching some TV because, you know, we don't really want to be working ourselves to death, do we? So, again, trying to impart a little bit of my own experience uh, for you guys that are just starting out. So I've painted in just a little bit of that light. I, I, I want to be kind of um, not gratuitous with it. You know, I, I want to be very, very careful as to how much I'm laying down. Um, Cause I, again, I want to use that, that middle tone, that flat tone um, to my advantage. Um, I, I, I don't want to cover it up completely because then it kind of defeats the purpose of, of, you know, of painting anything really. Um, you need a, a, a contrast between um, light and dark for it to, to have the proper illusion. All right, so I changed the guy's jacket color there because I thought it was a little too close to the other ones. I kind of wanted to create, again, some more separation. Um, again, oftentimes what I do is if I want my focal point to really, you know, be that strong focal point, I want everything else around it to be different. I want that one thing in my focal point to be unique. So typically the colors that I choose are going to be unique to that area. And you'll also notice that with this guy that I'm painting in the green uh, on the left-hand side, I use a little bit of that textured brush because uh, I, I want certain suits to have different textures about them, right? So the, the characters that are a little richer, that have uh, more wealth and connection, uh, they have a, a slicker suit, like it's made out of a, a nicer material. Uh, but some of the, the crowd goers, um, I want some of them not all of them, but I want some of them uh, to have almost like a, a grittier kind of quality to their suit, like their suit is made out of cheaper type of material. And that goes into the storytelling. Um, you know, as the colorist, you know, it, it, it really is dependent on you to, to create a lot of the mood. Um, yes, the artist can do a lot with the inks um, to create a, a, a set of uh, really interesting you know, scenes as, you know, as far as something that might be dark and gritty or, you know, something of light and, you know, intense. Um, but when it comes to, to a lot of mood creation, it's a lot in the coloring. Um, but, you know, coloring can also create um, some uh, a semblance of flow through the story. Um, so it's it's a good idea to, to be really asking yourself critical questions about your coloring and not just sort of be flippantly throwing things down like, oh, you know, that looks good. I think that looks good. I think that's a you know good idea for, for no reason, right? Um, you got to have reasons for things, you know, ask yourself questions. And if you find yourself you're not having reasons for things, you got to maybe take a step back and say, okay, well, maybe I need to ask myself some some better questions. All right, so now I'm into the highlight stage, the fun stage, where I'm putting in a little bit of rim light, uh, trying to find a little bit of highlight where I can, um, but not going overboard. Um, I'm, tr I'm just trying to put in enough um, to make it look as though these um, objects are catching the appropriate lighting. Okay, so again, always keeping track of where that light source is coming from. Not only what color the light source is, but what direction it's coming from. Whether or not my characters are gonna be backlit, whether or not they're gonna be front lit, side lit, under lit, above lit, all those things need to be asked of you before you lay down a stroke. 
And you'll notice that in that last kind of swipe that I did with the, the green suit there, the original, the first couple ones were really bright. And I decided that, you know, it's, it's just way too bright of a highlight. So I needed to tone it down and drop my opacity. Um, that's one thing I do a lot when I'm painting is I'm playing around with my opacity level of my brush, um, as well as sometimes playing around with the opacity level of the layer itself. Um, and, but most of the time it's, it's with the brush. And a, a lot of times when I paint in things that are supposed to be nice and soft, um, things that are supposed to be, um, you know, a, a, a nice subtle transition from one color to the next, um, I try to work that with opacity, you know, try to take the opacity down quite a bit, maybe to 25, 30%. Um, and then, you know, just building up in layers, using the, the pen pressure, the amount of pressure I'm really pressing down with um, to build up that pigment. Um, when you're first starting out, the tendency is to press down really hard with that brush. And, and what I find is if you're a little bit more soft with it, you have a little more finesse with it, um, you can lay down a much softer transition of value to get a much more realistic transition. All right, so now what I'm doing is adding in that strong spotlight for the stage where Tesca's standing. And with this, I'm playing around with a lot of blending modes. Um, so for this type of light, um, I'm using overlay for my blending mode. Um, I use overlay a lot when I'm trying to create a, a, a natural kind of look for light. Um, it's what I did for the spotlight. Um, I just added it to the turbine there at the top, the blue turbine. Um, but, you know, if you're using anything like fire or, you know, um, even just like regular light bulbs or a lamp or something like that, you know, that can be easily achieved. A nice natural glow can be easily achieved with an overlay layer. Um, so you would change your blending mode to overlay and then choose a color that's really close to the, the light source that you're trying to paint. So if it's say, in this case, uh, a big um, light from a, um, like a, a canopy light from a stage, um, you know, you would choose almost like a, a bit of a pale yellow. It's not quite yellow, so you wouldn't wanna choose, you know, say that, that real pale yellow that's in there. You might wanna choose something that's in between white and that. Um, and, and again, you don't wanna go full white with it either um, because you wanna have a little bit of that, that yellow color in it. Um, you don't want everything to have that that's, you know, white um, sort of glow to it. It should have a little bit of a, a color to it in order to look natural in my mind. Um, so now I'm, I am going in and painting shadows in for these guys because I wanted to, to really kind of to describe how intense uh, the light is from the stage. And, you know, sometimes the artists will paint in intense shadows. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're not in, entirely sure. And so they kind of leave that up to the colorist to, to add in if, if they so choose. So again, with this, if, if, if I were doing this page today, you know, I would use a, uh, a maybe a, a darker purple, maybe even like a, a reddish purple um, as, as my shadow color. Fill the whole canvas with that reddish purple color and then mask that color out using a layer mask. Fill that with black and then you can paint in your shadow wherever you feel it needs it. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, changing your blend mode to multiply, obviously. Um, again, with this, I, I tend to drop the opacity of the layer itself um, because I, I feel like it's, it comes out a bit too intense sometimes. It also depends on how dark your, your, your shadow color is to begin with. Um, if you choose a shadow color that's a little lighter in value, maybe you don't have to drop your opacity. Again, those types of things are up to you. Okay, so I'm going back into my highlight, throwing in a little bit of highlight every which way. Um, on these guys in the crowd, again, trying to just describe where the light source is coming from, as well as create some separation between the, the people and the background. And I'm almost done. I think I've got maybe one or two extra things I've got to do here before I, I call this page completely done. Uh, but it's coming together pretty good. 
I got nice separation. I've got a nice bright panel here at the bottom. You know, that's one thing that, again, keep in mind as you're painting a, an entire page, we want to also remember which panel is supposed to be the big, you know, star of the show, right? And, you know, in this case, it is quite literally the big guy on stage with the big bright lights, okay? Um, so, you know, you, you wouldn't want to pay too much attention to a smaller panel. You wouldn't want to give that smaller panel too much contrast or, or, or too much uh, of a bright, you know, light source or something that really, you know, draws your attention. You know, you want something that, you know, is a bit more subdued so that the panel that's supposed to be the star of the show can really shine. So again, just adding in more of these highlights, um, you know, working with that rougher, you know, kind of brush for some of these background elements and then painting in a little bit of this rim light or edge light to Edison to really give him that, that illusion that he's backlit. And now I think one extra thing that I might do for this panel in particular is I might go in with a little extra of that overlay uh, effect that we were talking about um, that I applied a light um, and maybe give a little bit of that to Edison himself to really make it look like those lights are intense. So I'm starting to put that, that glow over top with an overlay layer for the lights. And you can see that it really does make those lights pop. It makes them look like they're really turned on bright. And this effect works really well for this. It works well for fire. I, I think it works almost r the best um, for fire or an explosion of some kind. Um, it really makes it look intense, intensely hot. All right, so a little bit more highlight. So one last thing I'll do is if um, if I feel like a subject is, that you know that is supposed to be the focal point is not getting enough. Uh, attention or, or just isn't popping off the page or the panel enough, um, what I'll do is I'll go back with one more pass of the highlight and see if I might be able to pull out any areas to make that, that one person um, feel like they got a little bit more attention given to them. Um, you know, painting to me is about, you know, applying layers of detail. So, in the background, you don't want a lot of detail, you know, maybe one level of detail, you know. Um, but then as you work your way closer and closer to the subject matter or, you know, the focal point of your composition, you know, that is the area that gets the most attention, the most detail. You can spend all of the time on those with maybe very little uh, given uh, to the background. So last thing here, I'm putting in a, a little graphic design element uh, for that sign on the stage. Um, it, was, it was too small for the artist to draw, and I totally get it. So it was just a lot easier for me to do in Photoshop. Um, I originally created the sign uh, in Illustrator, I believe, and I brought it into Photoshop in the previous page. Um, and then now I just brought it over to this page. I believe these are the only two pages that to, to showcase it. Um, but, you know, one of the other reasons I use Illustrator is so that I can get a nice solid design and then I can use it multiple times and I don't have to keep going back to the, you know, Photoshop file and, you know, resourcing it from, you know, a small area. Um, I've got a nice, big, crisp, clean version of it that I can use again and again and again. All right, so added effects. We got some lightning going on for this turbine. So I just paint this above all my layers. Um, that's one last thing that I'll do at the very end. I'll go to the very top of my layer palette, and I'll just paint, start painting in, um, you know, things right on top of the line work. So you know, this is a, an added detail that I just wanted to to throw in there. It was something that the artist didn't throw in, but you know. Again, with painting, you, you can make some decisions on the fly. You know, you can say, hey, I really think that it would look better if we threw a little bit of this in there. Uh, try it out and, you know, see what the client likes. You know, if uh, you find out that they don't like it, it's on its, layer, on its own layer by itself. You can easily just remove it. No big deal. And that's 
again, the whole reason why I want everything to be on a separate layer so that I can edit things quickly. I don't have to go back in and just paint things out. Um, you know, if I were to, to just paint this entire thing on one layer, it would be nearly impossible to make edits to it. I mean, I could, sure I could, but it would take me forever. And in this business, you don't want to spend a lot of extra time, right? Um, I, I don't think any of us are making millions of dollars doing comic books, so every second in my mind counts. All right, so like I was saying before, I'm going to throw a little extra highlight on Edison. I think this is dang near the last thing I do for this page. And just to, to give him a little extra glow. And the reasons for that will become very apparent in the next page where he finds himself quite electrocuted. So it was a little bit of foreshadowing on my part. And again, these are the types of questions you want to ask yourself while you're going through and coloring a comic page. How am I going to use my coloring to improve the storytelling? How do I create a little bit of foreshadowing when I can? How do I create the, the right amount of mood to, to really push the envelope, right? And in this case, I just wanted to add a little bit of glow to him to really make him look like he was shining high on the mountain. All right. So we're getting pretty close to the end here, guys. I just wanted to thank everybody for checking out my video here. I'm going to be doing all kinds of comic book creation videos in the future, including drawing, um, layout creation, script translation, um, and everything in between. So here's the final page, lettered and all ready to go. All right, guys, don't forget to check me out on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And don't forget, Feast or Famine, Collected Edition, July 13th, only on Indiegogo.